All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, without further ado, let's get things rolling today. Uh, since we have a lot on our, our agenda. So uh, this is lecture 13. We are going to start into some new material today looking at morphology and thermal biology and performance and invasion and all of this really cool stuff. So our agenda looks like this. Uh, before we get into that, we are going to start off with quiz number two that you're all well aware of. And then I'm going to give a seminar on wall lizards. So a little bit different than a normal like class lecture. And I'll explain that what, what's going to happen with that when we get to there. And then uh, I'm going to freelance a little bit and talk about wall lizards and all the, the stuff that comes up in the seminar. Um, and you'll see what that looks like too. So just a little bit different structure than a traditional lecture. And then I'm just going to open up. I've got a few couple papers for you to read for next week. And we'll talk about our mud puppy trip on Monday. I hope that all of you have filled out the survey uh, at this point because I need to know what you're doing so we can plan accordingly. We'll look at that later in class and then just wrap up with some reminders. And then finally, we'll take the end of class today for you to give some feedback to Dr. Mason on his unit on venom. So that is the plan for today. First order of business is your quiz for which you'll have 20 minutes. It's open book, open note. So feel free to keep all your resources out. It is on paper. Uh, which in retrospect, I probably should have just made it on the computer since it's open note anyway, but here we are. Before we get started with this, what questions do you have? Okay, let me pause this recording. All right, let's bring it back here then. Will, do you mind getting the lights for me if you would? I will grade these quizzes back and, and get them back to you as soon as I am able. Um, I want to transition now and talk about our next uh, step here. Will, would you mind grabbing the lights for me if you don't mind? I am screen sharing. Okay, good. So what I want to do now is give a presentation on uh, the wall lizards here in Ohio. And I'm going to do this in a style that's not a normal lecture style. I'm going to give this as a scientific seminar, right? And this is like the format that you would see and you experience if you were going to a conference or a meeting or something like that. And there's a couple of reasons that I want to do it this way. The first is that uh, this is what you'd experience those of you interested in pursuing a career in biological sciences in some regard. This is kind of what you'll see if you ever go to a meeting or a conference or something like that. We used to have our great science seminar series on Thursdays that unfortunately has been waylaid since the pandemic. I'm hoping we can bring that back, um, but we'll see. Uh, that's a great place to see examples of this. So that's one reason. The second reason is I actually think it's good practice for you to be in a lecture where things are moving along and you're not going to be able to copy down every word. And the reason I think that's good is because it's going to help you pay attention first and foremost, and then distill information and just take notes on important things you maybe want to go back and look at or, or high, important details or something you don't understand you have a question about, rather than trying to write everything down. Having said that, after I go through this, we're going to have like a chalk talk where I'm going to debrief and decompress on some of the main ideas here. If we don't have time to get through it all today, then we'll pick this up again next week. This is the start of a unit that we're going to talk about, but ours is pretty extensively. Princeton's going to jump in um, both probably next week, but probably more after spring break, talking about some of his research with these guys. We've got lots of stuff going on uh, with them, and they're a great case study for a number of different concepts that we'll be exploring in this class. So just know that like we're going to continue talking about these these ideas, and so this is meant to be a general overview. The third reason I want to give it in this format is because I got invited to give a talk this Saturday at a meeting, and this is the talk I'm going to give, so I need to practice it. So thank you very much, you're all uh, guinea pigs. And I, the talk is supposed to be about 25 minutes long, and this is the first time I'm doing it, so I haven't timed it yet. Um, but I will, so it's going to be about that length. It'll probably go a little long. They always go long the first time. Um, so I'm going to present this as if I'm presenting at the meeting, both so you can have that experience and I can have that kind of practice and warm up for the meeting on Saturday. How's that sound for everybody? Cool. All right. So let's do it uh, here. I'm going to uh, set my timer here and I'll work through this. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Gangloff and I am in the Department of Biological Sciences at Ohio Wesleyan University. And I'm very happy to be here with you today talking about the common wall lizard and its success in novel environments, specifically here in Ohio. 
So before I get started with uh, dive into things, I want to just emphasize two really important ideas with this research. Um, the first is that this is truly a team effort. And in fact, the work that I'm presenting here is, is uh, largely due to the amazing undergraduates we have at Ohio Wesley. And you can see our team Padarsis here. Many of them are here today, both at the meeting on Saturday and actually in the room right now, at least a couple of you are here. And so I, this work, it just would not be possible without this fantastic group of folks. The second thing I want to emphasize is that we're just getting started. I've only been in Ohio here for uh, a couple years, and we are just beginning work on this really interesting system of wall lizards in Cincinnati. So everything I'm presenting today, we're in the very early stages of learning, uh, learning about these guys. So the wall lizard, or Podarsis moralis, is found in uh, the Cincinnati area where it's affectionately known as the Lazarus lizard. And it's known as the Lazarus lizard because of the family that's responsible for bringing it there. So the wall lizard is actually native to a large swath of southern Europe. You can see in black on the range map here. But back in 1951 or 1952, a young boy named George Rao uh, brought some home with him from a vacation in Europe. And you can see a sample of a letter that he wrote here. Uh, might be hard to read, so I'll read it. It says, contrary to reports that you may have heard from my parents, there were approximately 10 lizards among the first batch that I brought back from Lago di Garda in the northern lake section of Italy. I would guess the year was approximately 1951 or 1952. The climate in that section of Italy is almost exactly the same as Cincinnati, and they thrived upon my letting them go at my home on Torrens Court. So as you see here, the wall lizards are from a large swath of southern Europe, and this uh, young boy went on vacation to this area in northern Italy, and he brought them back in a sock on an airplane and let them go in his neighborhood in Cincinnati. And here you can see a map of the Cincinnati area with some identified sites where uh, confirmed reports of where we found these lizards. Now, what's notable is that that happened 70 years ago, and yet there's not too many red dots outside of the uh, main metropolitan area of Cincinnati. So this system is ideal for exploring a number of issues, especially given that we have an exact date of the lizard's arrival. We know approximately how many lizards were involved in that arrival, and we have good records of them over the past several decades. So the primary work of my lab here at Ohio Wesleyan is to explore uh, the ecological and evolutionary context of this invasion. And specifically, we're taking a three-pronged approach in addressing the question, what are the ecological conditions and the evolutionary context that permit this successful invasion in an urban environment. And to do that, we're looking at the relationship between morphology and performance, we're looking at thermal biology, and we're using genomic approaches to understand the underlying genetic mechanisms and constraints of this system. So I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about morphology and performance. The framework that we understand morphology and performance dates back to a seminal paper by Steve Arnold in 1983, Morphology, Performance, and Fitness. In this paper, he described a theoretical and a mathematical model that describes the relationship between morphology and organism's shape and size, its performance, its ability to do an ecologically relevant task in its environment, like grabbing or climbing or biting, and then ultimately how that relates to its fitness in an evolutionary sense. Now, he originally described this model, I was supposed to hit those as I was talking about each of these. So in the path model here, you can see the mathematical relationships among these terms. And he described this model originally uh, with using an egg-eating snake as an example, describing the various aspects of its morphology, its skull, shape, and size how that related to its performance, the speed with which it could eat an egg and the size of egg it could eat, and then ultimately how that tied to energetic benefits and subsequently its reproduction. Now we can take this framework and we can apply it to a number of situations as, it's, as has been done over the past uh, several decades. And within this framework, we started examining the, uh, the wall lizard relation, the, what do I want to say there? the relationship between wall lizard body size and shape and its ability to perform important tasks. And we did this first by collecting some lizards in the field. So good old fashioned field work. You can see some OU students here exploring some of the rocky walls and steps in Cincinnati, catching lizards. And we first uh, examined how, what kind of substrate these animals used 
in their uh, environments in Cincinnati. And you can see on the pie chart here that the overwhelming majority of lizards that we recorded were found using stone or otherwise human, um, uh, what do I want to say there? Stone or human created stone like landscapes like asphalt and walls and things like that. We did find a few on the grass and a few using other substrates, such as this guy running across some old road signs. Using the video recordings, we estimated their speed under these different conditions. And you can see here that they vary somewhere between uh, just under one meter per second, and in some cases sprinting up to two meters a second. So the takeaway here is that we know that they use these different substrates in their environment in Cincinnati, and we know that this affects their speed, their ability to run. Now in lizards, this running speed is really important because they, it's, uh, they need it to um, find food, right? They need to sprint to capture their prey items. They need to avoid predators. And it's also important for mating for these guys. We then performed, with this knowledge, we then performed an experiment in the lab. And this uh, culminated with the publication in the Biological Journal of the Linnaean Society, led by OWU undergraduate Princeton Vaughn, who's back there, Princeton. Um, and to do this, we collected specimens currently from Cincinnati, and we also uh, received specimens from the Cincinnati Museum Center that were collected in the 1980s. Princeton measured a number of morphological traits on these lizards, including their limb dimensions, as well as their tail and head and shoulder and pelvic girdle dimensions. And the first thing we wanted to do was test whether there was a difference in these animals that were collected three decades ago and animals living in Cincinnati today. First, in terms of their overall body size or snout vent length, we see that there's no difference, uh, meaning that lizards are not any larger or smaller today than they were 30 years ago in these urban environments. Other studies have shown that lizard body size changes pretty rapidly in urban environments. But when we look at this in a more fine scale sense, we found some pretty important shifts in body size. So this figure shows you a number of body size measurements uh, along the uh, y axis here, and the x axis shows you a standardized measure of those body sizes. And what we found here was first that their shoulder girdles of contemporary animals were larger than those of historical animals. And this can have important implications for locomotion as the size of the sh shoulder girdle can affect the overall stride length of an animal moving. In contrast, we found a number of other uh, body dimensions, including the pelvic girdle, the head length, the size of the hind foot, and the size of the front limb were all reduced in contemporary specimens. So this demonstrates that these guys are shifting, have shifted their morphological traits over time in ways that are not necessarily obvious. Different body dimensions are shifting in different ways. With this information, we then conducted an experiment in the lab in which we measured lizard sprinting performance under a variety of conditions. We measured sprinting um, on different substrates, including astroturf, cork, and sandpaper to mimic different substrates in their natural environment. We measured sprinting uh, on a flat surface as well as at an angle. We also measured their ability to sprint around obstacles or in a straight line. And with this experiment, we could then test the relationship of these morphological traits with their performance under these different ecologically relevant conditions. And what we found was first that surprisingly, lizards actually run faster uphill than they do on a flat surface. And we have some ideas for why this might be. It's something we're interested in exploring. Um, and it's a pretty a surprising and interesting result for us. They actually ran up a 45 degree angle faster than they could on a flat surface. Additionally, we found that lizards uh, exhibited trade-offs, meaning those that could run fast on one substrate could run slower on another substrate. So here is um, a figure showing some correlations in performance uh, between the different combinations of substrates. And you can see that all of these correlations are negative. So lizards that could run fast on cork, for example, would subsequently run slow on sandpaper and vice versa. And in fact, it was the sandpaper substrate that provided the strongest contrast with the other substrates. And finally, we wanted to know what aspects of morphology affected their sprint performance under these different conditions. And we found some interesting results here. One is that the size of an animal is important and, and speed increases with size, but only when they're running straight. So these two figures show you the body size of an animal on the x-axis and its speed 
on the y-axis. The panel on the left in red shows run, them running in a straight line, and the panel on the right in blue shows when they're running around obstacles. In other words, size is an advantage, but only uh, when you're running straight. If you're running around a lot of curves, then it's not necessarily advantageous to be bigger in size, which could explain why we haven't seen shifts in body size over the decades when these lizards have been here in Cincinnati. These are really interesting results. We are very happy with this publication. We wanted to continue exploring these ideas. So Princeton had the idea to look more closely at the animals, and in fact, very closely, specifically at their claws. So this is a close-up of a podarsis hind foot. You can see they have these very long toes, especially that fourth toe. And you can see on the end of each of those toes, claws that curve around and are very important for their ability to maneuver under different circumstances. Now, other studies, for example, in anolis lizards, have found that claw shape varies among populations, and especially between lizards living in urban and rural areas. So this is a figure, a couple figures from a paper that came out a couple years ago, showing differences in claw shape in different species of anolis lizards in urban and rural areas, um, both in terms of the images and the kind of standardized dimensions. So we want to explore this idea in our system. We actually took it a step further, and rather than just imaging these claws, we used the scanning electron microscope to um, get very high resolution images of these claws. And you can see we had to collect the claws from the lizard and dehydrate them, then we sputter coated, coated them with gold. And you can see here CC Caldwell and Princeton Vaughn looking at an image on the screen. Uh, and for this, I want to thank especially Dr. Laura Tahula Rooney uh, at Ohio Wesleyan, uh, as she was. She's our, our uh, scanning electron microscope guru there. And what we found imaging these claws was really interesting. First of all, we found that there was huge variation. You can see some examples of this here. Now, there's some examples that where the claws are even broken or snapped. We didn't use those in analysis, but I wanted to show them here because it's interesting to see this variety. But among these animals, there was great variety of shape and size and form of these claws. We wanted to quantify this variation, and there's a couple different ways we could do it. We can use an equation uh, from a paper published a couple decades ago on lizard claws in which we can estimate the curvature and size of the claw. And we can also use the statistical approach of geometric morphometrics to place landmarks on the claw and then describe how the size and shape of those claws shifts. And it's this latter approach that I'll unpack a little bit more here. The first thing we did was after uh, describing all of these claws in this kind of multi-dimensional space, we then examined along which dimensions of shape do they change the most. And we identified two main dimensions of claw shape that change. The first you see up top here, and you can see this is the principal component one for claw shape. You can see animals with a really low score had these short stubby claws, whereas animals with a high score on this dimension had this long elongate pointy claws. The second axis of variation describes claws that are either kind of thick and fat with a tiny little uh, kind of point here after the curve versus those that are fat at the bottom but have a longer, skinnier uh, distal part of the claw there. With this uh, variation described in this multidimensional shape, we then tested whether these claws shifted over time. Again, using these historical samples from the Cincinnati Museum and comparing them with our contemporary animals. So here you see all of the, the shapes of our claws overlaid on each other. If we break that down and find the average of current and historical claws, you can see that they're basically on top of each other. So they found no difference whatsoever in claw shape between those historical claws and the ones of animals today. Again, suggesting that this, this trait uh, has not been under selective pressure over the past uh, 30 years or so. We then wanted to examine how this variation in claw shape affected their ability to perform. And this time, instead of sprinting the lizards, we uh, performed two different tests. Uh, we, we uh, what do I want to say here? We measured two different aspects of their performance that are highly important for them under their natural circumstances. On the left, you can see clinging performance, where we pull the lizard backwards using a force meter on different substrates to see how strong its grip was. And on the right, you see a lizard climbing vertically. So essentially the same as a sprint test, only straight up at a 90 degree angle. First, we found that lizard, uh, the shape of the claw was important for climbing, but that importance depended on what they were climbing on. Here you see a figure that shows their claw shape along that first axis of variation. So describing short stubby claws on one side 
versus long skinny claws on the other. So on the y-axis, as you see, the log transform speed running up cork versus turf. And you can see here that claw shape is much more important for turf than it is for cork. The slope of this line is much steeper compared to the line for cork. Unpacking this a little bit more, we found some very complex interactions between claw shape and body shape in, uh, in, in uh, determining their ability to cling to different substrates. So here is their performance for clinging. And what I'm gonna show you here are some 3D figures. I don't need to get lost in the details here, but the X and Y axes here show claw and body shape. And the Z axis, how high the surface is, shows their performance. And what I want you to take away from this is this. The two figures you see here are for their ability to cling to turf and cork, and they look very similar. In other words, the shape of those surfaces are, are darn near the same. If we contrast this, however, with sandpaper, we find that that shape is totally wackamadoodle. It's completely different, meaning that different combinations of claw shape and body shape provide for better grip on sandpaper as compared to the other substrate. Very interesting, we're working on unpacking this a little bit right now and trying to understand exactly what combinations of body and claw shape are best under these different circumstances. Finally, we found another interesting result in terms of trade-offs between clinging and climbing performance. Specifically, we found that animals that are good clingers are bad climbers and vice versa. So here you see a, a correlation matrix again. Values in orange show positive correlations, values in green show negative. So if we look at all the different combinations of climbing, we see that there's strong positive correlations and the same for different combinations of clinging in different conditions. You see a lot of orange circles uh, inside those two blue boxes. If we contrast performance climbing and clinging, however, we find a lot of negative correlations and in fact, very strong negative correlations, suggesting that individuals that are better at clinging, cling, climbing, excuse me, are worse at clinging and vice versa. So we're trying to understand the implications for that of these animals in their natural setting. And finally, with this experiment, we ask yet one more question, and that is, we have all of this relationship between, temp or between body shape and performance. We also know lizards being ectotherms, temperature is going to be very important and affect nearly every aspect of their performance. And so we conducted all of these tests at two different temperatures as well. So here you can see their clinging force on the y-axis uh, on different substrates, as well as hot and cold temperatures here across the z-axis. What I want you to notice here is that each of these, um, each, their performance on each substrate was the same, whether it was hot and cold. So under cork, sandpaper, and turf, the temperature did not affect their ability to cling to different substrates, which is kind of surprising to us. We did, however, find that temperature was very important for climbing. So this figure shows the speed, climbing speed on the y-axis, and again, climbing under hot and cold conditions on cork and turf on the x-axis. And you can see here that on both cork and turf, they increased their speed dramatically as it got warmer, which is what we expect. The important takeaway here, though, is that temperature is affecting some aspects of performance, but not all. And to better understand this, let me bring us back to our original framework here. We talked about morphology performance relationships in this novel environment. This last result points to some interesting directions in terms of thermal uh, biology. And so our takeaway message from the morphology performance bit is that lizard performance is complex and uh, context specific. We can't assume that because a lizard is gonna sprint good and uh, sprint well in one place, it's gonna be a good sprinter under different conditions. And that last result, as I mentioned, pointed some, points to some interesting directions in terms of thermal biology. Now, our underlying question uh, in our, exper our work with thermal biology is addressing how wind might affect thermal regulation. Actually, I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna say, uh, we know that thermal physiology plays a very important role in organisms inhabiting new environments. So there's been some recent paper that have shown that generally, as well as some really nice work on lizards adapting to urban heat islands. Of course, many of us have heard of something called climate change is happening pretty dramatically as well. But interestingly, climate change isn't affecting species equally. So there's a really nice paper here by Martha Munoz and others uh, just from a few months ago showing that different lizards are affected differently by climate change and some are benefiting, uh, but some are not in these uh, mountains in the tropics. And so what we wanted to do was examine this 
in the context of our lizards in Cincinnati. So this is a heat map of Cincinnati showing variation across the city. Now, important to note, this is a variation at a macro scale across the city, but within each site, we find great variation, uh, um, micro, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Macroscopic, no, microscopic, small scale, microhabitat variation in temperature as well. Thanks there, Ethan. And to examine that, we use the thermal imaging camera. So you can see on the left here an example of a thermal imaging camera, an image from our thermal imaging camera of a lizard on a wall. You can see the uh, lizard just above the crosshairs there in bright yellow. It's the warmest uh, object in that picture. You can see uh, Sierra Spears here taking a picture of that wall with the thermal camera. Now, there's a lot to explore with thermal biology of these lizards. Our question specifically focused on wind and the relationship of wind to lizards' uh, thermal regulatory behavior and their ability to maintain their body temperature. Other studies have shown that wind is imp an important factor, yet until last week, no study has been published that actually measured this in a controlled experiment. And the, so the first thing we did was measure the body temperature of lizards in the field and relate that to wind speed. And we found something that looks like this, wind speed on the x-axis, body temperature on the y-axis, and we found no relation. At least among, uh, across the, the range of conditions that we found these animals, there's no relationship between wind speed and uh, body temperature in the field. We then brought lizards back to the lab and conducted, conducted a controlled experiment in which we subjected lizards to different levels of wind while they were thermoregulating. So you see on the left here, our experiment, or to do this, we place lizards in this thermal gradient. It's hot on one end and cool on another. You can see that quite nicely with the thermal image here. And we conducted this experiment. You can see our setup on the left. We've got the lizard in the gradient there. We've got a fan either on or blowing down on top, of the, on top of the gradient. We've got the thermal camera recording body temperatures of lizards every 30 seconds for a two hour period. And we also video recorded the trial simultaneously. So we could watch the lizard from a distance without disturbing it. And also so we could extract the movement data from the animal. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So what did we find in our experiment? The gist of it was, we had we hypothesized that lizards would choose to be in cooler temperatures when it was windier because of the risk of water loss because they become dehydrated um, in the wind and so need to choose cooler temperatures to measure the the hydric the the hydration status of animals we used hematocrit now hematocrit is a measure of the relative density of red blood cells compared to blood plasma so we collected a small uh, blood sample from lizards, we spun it down, and then we can get the ratio of the packed red blood cells to the total volume of plasma. And that's a rough indicator of an individual's hydric status. We then looked at that at lizards under windy conditions and no wind conditions. And you can see there, we had a repeated measures design. All the animals were measured under both conditions, and there is absolutely no relationship there whatsoever. So under this, these conditions of, of wind, Lizards were not, uh, this, was, this level of wind was not affecting their, hydric, uh, their, their hydration status. Now we speculated that the reason it wasn't affecting their hydration status was because that lizards were choosing cooler temperatures under windy conditions. And in fact, this is one of the great examples of why we do science. We found this very, very clear, nice, neat result from this experiment in exactly the opposite direction that we hypothesized. In fact, lizards very clearly, every single animal except for one, chose higher body temperatures under conditions of this light breeze than conditions without any wind whatsoever. We we're a bit baffled by this. We're trying to unpack this right now. Our thought right now is that this wind conditions that we use was very light. It was just a light breeze. And so maybe lizards are using that breeze as a cue to affect their behavior. But because it's such a light breeze, it's not actually reducing their body temperature through dehydration, um, uh, through dehydration cooling. And so they're changing their behavior, but it's not affecting their physiology. But we need to unpack that more by conducting an experiment across a broader uh, number of wind conditions. So very cool result. Uh, it's always exciting to get results exactly the opposite of what you expect. One more thing we're doing with this work, I mentioned that we video recorded all the trials as well. And we are working with, um, collaborators at the University of Toronto, specifically my good friend, Dr. Vianney Leos Barajas, and two undergraduate students in her lab, Sophie Berkowitz and Simone Collier. I didn't have a picture of Simone, so I just put Missy Elliott up there. 
I don't know if anybody knows that. Anyway, um, and using some tracking software, we can track the position of lizard across uh, the entire trial for the, the two hours that they're in the gradient. And we can then extract their movement patterns. So how fast they're moving and exactly where they're moving in the Serena across that time. Our statistical friends here are then using some hidden Markov movement models to then describe different behavioral states uh, to, char to characterize these movement patterns into different behavioral states. So you can see an example here. Uh, we see time across the x-axis here. This is the time the lizard is in the gradient. The y-axis is how far they move in a given time step. And you can see they have two behavioral states more or less here. In blue, you see uh, when the lizards are actively moving long distances, whereas in red is when they're uh, basically stationary or moving short distances. We're currently working on this analysis that will allow us to assess if their actual behavior changes under conditions of wind or no wind, even as their, um, their hyd hydric status stays the same and they're selecting higher temperatures in the wind conditions. So we're very excited to continue that. Uh, look for that coming out in the next year or so. So some cool work in terms of thermal biology. The takeaway message here is that wind is important, but we're not really sure uh, uh, how it's important and when it's important. We need to unpack that. And as I said, just uh, last week, a paper came out that we were, we were excited because we thought this experiment was going to be the first time anyone had ever measured thermal regulation under controlled conditions in a lab with wind and no wind and looked at this. And last week, a paper came out that did just that in skinks. A little bit different than ours, but they they scooped us a little bit. But we're excited about that because that means people are interested in this kind of thing. So with that, I want to take us to our last approach here, uh, understanding the ecological conditions and evolutionary context that allow for a successful invasion, and that is using a genomic approach. So genomics approach describes uh, using information across the entire the organism's entire genome, so all of its gene sequences, in understanding. Um, the evolutionary context that allows uh, different um, that either allows or or, or um, inhibits uh, different responses at the phenotypic level. And this work is in partnership with Dr. Andrew Mason, who's a postdoc at Ohio State University, as well as undergraduate Briley Park uh, here at Ohio Wesleyan. And in recent uh, years, there's been a booming interest in using genomics generally, but also specifically to understand how uh, invasive species are successful or not using these genomic tools. Now we're just starting this work, so I don't have any results to present yet, um, but our plan is this. We are going to um, sequence the entire genomes of 20 different lizards, uh, including five from the original uh, native range in Italy, where these guys are from, from back in the 2000s, uh, including uh, five lizards that are from Cincinnati about 20 years ago as well as five lizards from Cincinnati today. And excitingly, this past summer, we got a tip off and there is an established population of wild lizards up in Columbus. So we're gonna sequence five of their genomes as well. And with this information, we can uh, ask uh, a number of really interesting questions. For example, what is the genomic effects of that original founding event, that very narrow bottleneck of 10 animals uh, being released? How has, has there been a selective pressure on certain genes over uh, the time that these animals have been in Ohio or since uh, they've been in Italy? And also we can look at, see, and, and confirm that the Columbus animals represent, um, uh, were, were uh, um, spread from Cincinnati and don't instead represent a novel uh, invasion event independent of the lizards in Cincinnati. So a lot of cool work we can do with that. Uh, we're just getting started, and I'm really looking forward to sharing that with uh, everyone hopefully next year. So with that in mind, uh, I just want to share a couple other quick, uh, smaller projects we've been working on in the lab as well. Uh, students have been really interested in mites, and so we find a lot of red mites on the lizards in certain populations in Cincinnati. Other populations, we find no mites at all. We're really curious about this, and students are working to identifying what these are. So this is one of our mites under uh, uh, light, uh, a light microscope. We have it identified down to the family level, but we're working on identifying it down to the genus and species. We also got some really nice SEM images of these mites. We're hoping to learn more about them and specifically understand why they're on some, in some populations, 100% of the animals have them and other populations, uh, basically none of the animals do. 
We're also exploring some blood biomarkers that uh, to use as indicators of animal health and stress. This includes corticosterone, a st uh, stress and energy related hormone, glucose, triglycerides. Uh, we're doing some initial work in the lab right now. Our pr uh, preliminary analyses show that we did not find any relationship between body temperature and corticosteroid concentration or any differences in cort concentration between male and female lizards. We're looking at expanding that data set and continuing that, uh, that work as well. So really exciting stuff. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and working on all of this and extremely grateful for the folks that have uh, supported us and welcomed me to Ohio uh, in the past couple of years, especially I wanna thank Jeff Davis. He's been incredible in helping us find what our populations in Cincinnati, uh, Greg Lips and Heather Farrington at the Cincinnati Museum Center, as well as a number of other collaborators and funding sources, uh, especially um, a couple of students that have received uh, grants to support this work. You can see our lab website here, and I'm also on Twitter, and I would be happy uh, with that to take any questions. Thanks, everyone. Yay. All right, so let's do this. Let's go. We can't, we can't do this if we don't do it properly. Let's take five and we'll come back. Sound good? All right, I'm gonna pick things up again uh, from here. Let's give everyone a second to get back. We missing anybody yet? Tina and this guy's are back. Um, what I'd like to do is just kind of lecture about what I covered generally and give you some of the main ideas and answer questions and uh, just kind of just kind of give you a little bit of structure to what we just talked about. So some key vocabulary words that we need to know off the top. Uh, and I'm trying to situate the camera so it picks this up. But just if not, maybe someone at the end can grab a photo of the chalkboard and send it to me and we can make sure everyone in the class gets it. Um, so some important terms. Uh, you can ignore everything to the left of here unless your name is Michaela or Ethan, in which case you should know that stuff for your lab quiz on each. OK, um, so founding event, no pressure. So this describes when a, um, an organism is moved from one place to another. And this can take a variety of forms. It can happen kind of naturally. So a great example of this is we know that iguanas in the Caribbean actually can float on mats of vegetation between islands when there's hurricanes and big storms like that. Tortoises got to the Galapagos essentially by floating either on their own or on mats of land from South America to the Galapagos Islands so many million years ago. And that's considered a, a founding event. In the propagule size, I think that's an A, that is the number of individuals. And so if there's a large propagule size, that means a whole bunch of individuals come. If there's a small propagule size, it means not as many. And so, uh, uh, you know, think about an iguana on a land map. That's one animal. That's going to be a very low propagule size. Whereas, you know, an event uh, where, let's say, here's a great example, Florida, which is a total reptilian shit show, but that's a different story. Part of the reason for that is because of the pet trade. And what happens is a lot of animals are brought from wherever they catch them in the wild, and there's these big wholesalers in Florida where they keep all the animals and they distribute them to smaller pet stores and stuff like that. Well, what has happened many times historically is those places, a hurricane comes, and let's say they have, let's just say, for example, they have a bunch of green iguanas that people collected in Central America, brought up to Florida for the pet trade, super common animal in the pet trade. Storm comes through, blows the roof off of their enclosure. Now you've got a whole bunch of iguanas loose in Florida. This is basically what's happened there. And let's say that you had 400 iguanas in that enclosure, roof blows off in a hurricane, they all get out. Well, now you've got a very large problem. So that's gonna make a huge difference in the ability of those animals to be established. Very intuitively, the larger the propagule size, the better the chance that they'll become established. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is just stochasticity. If you get one, an one green iguana gets out uh, and gets hit by a car, well, then there's not gonna be established. If you have 400 green iguanas get out, one of them gets hit by a car, you've got 399 more of them. The other important aspect of this is the genetics, right? And we had something called a bottleneck. 
you have all probably come across this. I don't know if you cover this in organisms in their environment, but certainly if you've taken evolution or genetics, you have seen a lot of head nods. This is a familiar term, right? The basic idea here is that this is a reduced genetic variation associated with a founding event, or, or it doesn't have to be a founding event, uh, associated with um, some kind of event. So it could be animals that are in the same place and a whole bunch of them die except for a few, or it can be a genetic bottleneck associated with a founding event where you have a few new animals coming to you, right? Now, the idea of that is that you're getting a, a random set of the genetic variation of a population into a new place. And just by chance, you could get some different kinds of alleles. So let's take, for example, let's pretend we have a population of iguanas and we have 10 iguanas, let's say, but each, each of these, let's say, represents a thousand animals. So we're going to have a, 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 a 10,000 animal uh, populations. And half of these animals have some allele that they're orange, and half of them have some allele that they're blue in this founding population, right? Now, let's say that by random chance, some of these guys get picked up and brought and dropped off in Cincinnati or Florida or wherever. And let's say that just one of them gets picked up. Right? Then we have about a 50 50 chance of that individual being an orange individual or a blue individual. Now, if five of them get picked up, well, then it's probably most likely going to be a mix of blue and orange. Because you, if you pick uh, out of these 10, you pick five of them at random, there's a really low chance of picking five um, orange ones. Then we can actually figure out that probability. It would be uh, what would it be? One half times four ninths times three sevenths times two sixths or one third times one fifth. Do that math, and it's a very low probability if you figure all that out, right? And with a founding, with with a bottleneck, the idea is that you might just get a subset of the genetic variation. So let's say there's two individuals that found this new population in Cincinnati. There's actually a fairly good chance that those two individuals could both be blue. So now you have a new population over here. The founders are blue. There's no orange alleles. They're all going to be blue. And so what this bottleneck does is it limits the genetic variation in this new environment. And so one of the things that we're exploring with the genomic aspect of the podarsis work is to say, OK, there was definitely a genetic bottleneck because there was only 10 individuals. And they actually have done some uh, research a couple years ago, folks from the University of Cincinnati. And they think at one time that it was down to, even though there were 10 original individuals, there was only two or three reproductive adults among those 10. So you had two or three individuals. And now there are, I mean, there's there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of these animals across this. Have any of you seen them down there? Have you, I don't know if anyone's from that area or explored down there. Ethan, I know. Princeton, you've seen these guys, right? A couple times. They're, when you go to the like uh, the places where they are, though, I mean, they're everywhere. They're just, they're just all ubiquitous across the city, right? You, any, any, almost any stone wall, or any like anything like that you find in the city, they're they're just all over the place, um, and that's from an original two or three individuals. Now we'd expect that to be really negative, have negative consequences because of that reduced genetic variation, but apparently it hasn't, and it doesn't all the time. And that's a paradox that um, researchers are trying to kind of figure out and understand. So, um, so that's one big uh, idea I wanted to make sure I covered from that. Let me just pause here and take questions, and then I want to talk a little bit about morphology and performance. I'm going to erase it. Will someone grab a picture of this? Who, who I need a, uh, someone who's willing to take pictures of notes today and give them to me later. Great. Thanks, Ethan. Do you want me? I, I could pose in there if you want. You could just get like a really professorial picture of me like this, like writing on there. You sure? We'll put, we'll, we'll put it in the yearbook. OK, what questions do you have? I, we are with the herpetology your book yeah we could put it on the website i guess yeah yeah go ahead are those thermal that you have yeah was it just um created by the fan on one side and you guys are just like you feel ah great question so athena asked uh just to make sure everyone could hear um we have the thermal gradient it was about a meter long and actually i'll show you in the lab and, and, and princeton's going to show some demonstrations of the work we did um but we had a, a ceramic heating bulb on one side and so the gradient it got in the, the hot side was 40, 50 degrees C, which is what, 115, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, it was really hot. And then the cool side was basically room temperature. And the lizards, 
really consistently picked a body temperature of around 33, 34 degrees C. Um, so yeah, and what was actually the real challenge was to get that same gradient with the fan on it, because then we have to adjust it because the fan's cooling everything down. So it took a lot of finagling to, to get that. that way. SK, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Ah, great question. Uh, we took it immediately uh, afterwards. So like we fucked the lizard out and then got a blood sample like within seconds, ideally, just because we wanted to get that, we wanted to get the data, you know, we wanted to get that measure as close as possible to the actual test. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Cool. All right, let's talk about what time is it? 30. I want to just introduce one concept here quickly, and we're going to do something we're going to return to quite a bit, especially after spring break. But that's that's the relationship between morphology, performance, and fitness. And the idea here is that the important takeaway is that morphology is the size and shape of uh, parts of an animal's body or plant's body. Performance is its ability to do something. And then fitness in the evolutionary sense, remember fitness has two important parts. One is surviving and the other is having babies. If you don't have babies and pass your genes onto the next generation, in an evolutionary sense, you have zero fitness, right? And so I want to be clear that when I talk about fitness, I'm not talking about like some super buff lizard that can pump a bunch of iron. I'm talking about a super good at doing something lizard that can make a bunch of babies. So the currency of fitness is always the uh, genes that you're passing on to the next generation. Actually, more specifically, what's important about fitness is not the genes that you contribute to the next generation, but the genes you contribute to your grandkids generation. That's really what matters because that's what's going to propagate uh, through subsequent generations. This orange and blue truck doesn't erase from the truck board. That's really interesting. Cool. So the idea here is that we have to think about performance mediating this relationship between morphology and fitness. We can't think of a change in body shape automatically changing an organism's fitness. And so let me think of a good example of that. Uh, the neck of a giraffe is a great example. It's not the case that a giraffe just that has a long neck is all of a sudden going to have more babies because it's got a long neck. There has to be something that happens in between there that thus provides a selective pressure on animals in this case, to have a long neck. So with giraffes, they have this male-male combat. The males bang their necks against each other. And basically, whoever wins that gets to have more babies. And so the performance measure here, the, the morphology measure, is the length and strength of the neck. The performance measure is their ability to knock down another male with a long neck. And then that has a fitness consequence in terms of, in this case, access to mates and differential reproductive output. Go ahead, Jordan. Is it kind of double up with the fitness? Yeah, so so that's a great example. Actually, we came across this term uh, last week. That's an, a great example of an exaptation, right? Is that that long neck also kind of conveniently happens to let them reach higher leaves on a tree. Although we know for some recent work that that's not the primary driver of selection for the drafts that have the super long neck. It's actually this kind of uh, intraspecific competition. But then it does. That's a great, I'm glad you said that Jordan has this, it's an acceptation. So like it was selected for in one context, but it also happens to be really good in another context. And so with our lizards, what we're primarily interested in is the size and shape of their limbs. And having bigger or smaller legs doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have more or less babies. But what it does mean is that you can maybe run or climb or cling or um, do whatever in, in a way that enhances your performance and that in turn maybe lets you get more food so you have more energy to produce more offspring maybe it allows you to fight off other males so you have access to females so you can have more offspring maybe it allows you to hide from predators faster so that you don't get eaten and you have more offspring so the point of this i want to take i want to bring everything back to the fact that for evolution to be meaningful, to, to talk about these things in an evolutionary context, we always need to bring it back to this idea of fitness and reproductive output, because that's ultimately what's going to change the relative ratios of different alleles in the population, which is then going to influence those phenotypic traits such as morphology 
in the population over time. So interestingly, with our lizards, we found that their claw morphology, we found no evidence that it's changed since the 1980s. They really, and it was like astoundingly no evidence. Like they were exactly the same uh, claw shape from the historical specimens and from our contemporary specimens. But body shape changed in all of these kind of weird ways that we're still trying to understand. And we actually did the same experiment twice, and we found very similar but not identical shifts in body between the two uh, experiments, suggesting that, like, yeah, this is a real result. And we are um, seeing, like, that these lizards have shifted parts of their body. Now, exactly why their shoulder girdles get bigger, but their pelvic girdles got smaller, that's something we're trying to unpack and, and really understand here. Is that a fair assessment, Princeton? Chase, go ahead. Yeah, I just have a question from my so Yep. The morphology of like the body shape is different from the Cincinnati ones are different from the historical Italy ones, the Italy ones today. Ah, great question. I'm really glad you asked that for clarifying that. So in the experiment we did, we compared um, lizards from Cincinnati today with lizards from Cincinnati in the 1980s. What we don't have and what would be amazing is to have like specimens from Italy in the 1950s in the same area where these guys were from and then compare. That would be ideal. Just doesn't exist. Great question. We haven't looked at that yet. We have, uh, there are animals in Columbus. We're actually going to get a bunch of them in the spring. And we, this class might be involved with that. We'll talk about that after spring break a little bit, but we might get a bunch of those animals in the lab. And one of the things we'd like to do is measure the morphology and compare it and all that. So the answer is you're going to do that later <laughs> if you want. Uh, we'll talk about it later. So um, yeah, we're not sure. We're not sure what's going on with those Columbus animals. We just uh, were tipped off to them in August, and, and but it's a pretty robust population in a parking lot of a high school in a really weird spot that doesn't look like, like if you were going out looking for lizards, you wouldn't be like, oh, there's the spot. There's a hedge on a busy street next to a school bus. Like it's really random. <laughs> Uh, Columbus Downtown High School. Is anyone familiar with this? CDHS? No. It's right. I mean, it's smack in downtown Columbus, though. It's not like in the suburbs or anything like that. It's like right down here. Cool. I'm going to stop here. Uh, we're going to pick up some of these concepts, as I mentioned, in the coming weeks. Uh, I'm pretty excited to talk about this stuff. And um, we'll get to, I didn't really talk about the thermal biology much at all, except for answering a few questions, but we'll get to that. Uh, coming up. So that's a little bit of an intro. But right now, I want to uh, talk about what you're going to be doing to explore these ideas a little more. And for this, I need to put the projector back on. So just give me a quick second to do this. Go. Will, can I get you to take care of the lights? Thank you very much. All right, so with this all in mind, your assignment for next week, uh, Wednesday, is to read one of these two papers that explore this idea in more detail. The first is an older paper from 2001 or two, I think. And this looks at the relationship uh, between different kinds of sprinting in lizards uh, in the family Lacertidae across different species and looks for evidence of trade-offs, specifically here that lizards that can sprint fast can also climb fast or not. The other paper is more recent and links locomotor performance uh, in urban lizards to morphological shifts, so very much in line with the work that I was just talking about that we've done here that Princeton's done. And so what you'll do is you're going to read one of these two papers for next week, Wednesday. And you are going to use your how to read a research paper guide in doing that, how to get the big main ideas out. And then on Wednesday, we're going to do an activity where you're going to get a partner who read the other paper, and you're going to teach them all about your paper. And then you're going to swap. And then everybody's going to learn a whole bunch of stuff, and it's going to be awesome. And then you're going to have a great spring break. So I would recommend preparing some things for that. So for example, a quick summary of the paper you can share with them maybe an image of the lizards in question so they can visualize it, maybe pick out important figures that explain the main ideas, and that kind of thing. Go ahead, Catherine. Oh, you don't get to pick. Yeah, that's why. Uh, the assignments were six class points, and in your class program for Wednesday, uh, you're assigned one of the two papers to answer your question. Yeah, it's, it's one off because we have 27 people, so there's one extra one, so we'll figure it out. 
But yeah, I'm glad he said that. So this is all detailed. Uh, you have a class program, not for Monday, but for Wednesday next week, because Monday is the field trip. We're going to talk about that in just a second here. Um, your assignment for Wednesday is simply to read this one paper and prepare a little bit. And then I also put a link to a video on YouTube that is seven minutes long about the Podarsis lizards in Cincinnati. I actually just came out like last August, the Cincinnati Nature Center or something like that, uh, put out this really nice short video and they actually interview the graduate student from the from University of Cincinnati that did some of those initial genetic analyses to identify the bottlenecks and all of that. So it's a nice little video, kind of complements what I was talking about here. Again, it's just seven minutes long and then you read this paper and that is all of your assignments for next week. I want to talk about the mud puppy trip now, um, but I want to just pause here and see what questions you have before I do that. Ooh, I didn't mean to do that, though. There we go. Questions? Yep. Yep, all of these details are in the program. It also tells you who's doing what, um, and the two papers are in your reading uh, resources in the in Blackboard as well. Yeah, thanks for asking that, Michaela. So do you have a question? Oh, no, I'm not. Just stretching. <laughs> All right, let me pull up. Uh, let's do this next, actually. Uh, our mud puppy trip is Monday, and it looks like it's going to be a go. The weather looks good. We're finally going to do this. I'm really excited. Uh, I've got 20. Who didn't respond? Seriously? I put. Then, all right, let's take a quick look here. I sent a reminder out. And it was on your, oh, okay. I'm not gonna get too mad. Okay, so just looking real quick here on, uh, remember you have the option to go to one or the other. You're welcome to go to both, but I need to know who's going to what just to um, have an idea. It looks like 13 of you are gonna ride in the Owu van on Monday, uh, and six of you are gonna drive yourself, and seven of you aren't gonna attend. So those of you driving yourself, I will put out uh, like the map on um, group me, make sure you have that. We are gonna depart here. Our plan is to depart Ohio Wesleyan at 210 and it takes about a 20 minute drive. So please plan on doing about the same. Those of you, the 13 people that are planning on going, if you are one of these people and you decide for whatever reason to change your mind, please let me know right away because I know who these people are and uh, I'm gonna be waiting for you and like making sure you're there before we leave. So if your plans change, please let me know right away. We'll need to take two vans down there. I can check in with a couple of you that are van driver. Actually, I guess just ask right now, either of you that are van drivers going on Monday during the class time, would one of you be willing to drive one of the vans? Awesome, thank you so much for that. And then Monday night, so then we'll come back here and then we'll leave at about 6 p.m. And we've got uh, a tenant ride in Obu van. We've got 11 of you doing that, so we can probably get away with just one van. Although Princeton, you're gonna go too, right? Tuesday, Monday night, so we'll have to figure that out. Are, are Chase or Judy, are either of you going Monday night? You are too, Judy? Okay, great. So I'm gonna, would you mind driving a second time if we need to? Okay, super. That's covered. A bunch of you won't be there, and then one person's going to go by themselves, plus Ethan, whatever the hell he's going to do. He's on his own at this point. Okay, so I just want to make sure we had that covered. The reason I'm doing this during class time is because if there's some major issue we all need to sort out, I want to just do it while we're all here. Sam, go ahead. Oh yeah, I'm glad you asked that question actually. We will meet, um, let's see here. Let's just meet in the parking lot, the, the Science Center parking lot. So the one that's over this way, um, it's a small parking lot. You'll see I'll be the guy with the Owu van. I'll probably have like a stylish winter coat on and a bunch of waiters and I'll be at the van. So let's just meet in the parking lot. That'll be quicker than coming up here. Good, um, yep, Krista, go ahead. Yes, right by the greenhouse, exactly. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, or, do you want us to grab waiters if we're driving separately, or are you just going to grab? Them? I'm just going to grab a whole bunch, and we're going to sort it out. It's not going to be perfect, but I think having all of us size waiters. Just actually, give me a quick show of hands. If if we if I did bring waiters, how many of you would actually put them on and, and get in the water a little bit? <laughs> Most of us. Okay, so we're going to do that. All right, I'll just grab a crap load of waiters and we'll figure it out. Because then it, then it'll be easier if I just keep them all together. Yeah, so. we okay. Have a lot of we do have a lot of waiters. Yeah. So quick expectations. I uh, looked at the forecast, of course, it's a little ways out, but it's going to be about 30, 35 degrees. So not terribly cold, but chilly. And uh, we're going to be outside for a good hour. So please make sure you're dressed accordingly. Um, if you want water, snacks, bring those. 
and just be ready to participate. Remember, we're only handling amphibians with gloves. These guys, will, you'll see anyway, but in general, we do that. We're gonna make sure we use chlorine bleach on all of your footwear and disinfect it before we get out there. And if you're not sure about anything, especially in regards to handling animals, please, please never hesitate to ask. Also, I didn't put this up there, but don't pick up any rattlesnakes. I know, I heard somebody say, uh, yeah, Chris, got it. It's, I've never had that problem. We just spray the bottom of it and then we'll spray the waders. Um, but it's never, yeah, I mean, you don't want to like spray it directly in your pants or anything, but it's really pretty dilute. And we just focus it on the bottom of your shoes. So don't wear like your new fancy, I don't know what's a fancy shoe. I don't even know what a fancy shoe is. What's a fancy shoe that would get ruined? But what's that? Say again? Nikes? Yeah, don't wear your new Air Jordans. You get them, yeah. Because you're gonna get you're gonna get them a little wet probably anyway and possibly muddy even so. so should we wear Say again, rain boots. Like rain, boots or something like that. rain boots would be good because you know we'll get we'll be on the kind of rocks along the shore. Um, I don't know exactly what the conditions will be like in terms of water versus ice versus snow, but just whatever kind of rugged outdoor footwear you have would be good. If you want to. I mean, like without the wind. No, I wouldn't recommend it. Okay. Yeah, if you want to, Sid, though, I'm not, I'm not going to get in your way. If you're like mud puppy. <laughs> Go for it. Yes, Nebraska. It's a. Uh, I mean, it's a. It's a. It's like the crick, so you could get in as deep as you want. I mean, minimum, it's going to be like this. Okay. I think right when you get off the shore, but I mean. Yeah, you're not going to go swimming or anything, but you could get in. You could get in a foot or two of water pretty easily. Mm -hmm. What's that? Yeah, you could. I mean, maybe later in the semester. <laughs> you won't. You won't die on any field trip for the class. I promise you, Sam. You will live to the end of this class. All right. Couple of quick announcements before I wrap things up. I want to remind you, you've got this class program for Wednesday. It's got details on it. Remind you that next Monday I'll still have open hours before we go on our trip. I might actually cut this a little short so I can get the vans and get some stuff prepped. Um, if anyone, actually, I'll just put this out there. If anyone is around at, say, about quarter to two or so and is available during that time and wants to meet me here to give me a hand with some stuff, uh, I'd actually really appreciate that. So, yeah, let's just actually, I didn't think about that till just now, but at 145, let's meet in this room. If you're available and can just give a hand, that'd be great to get the waiters ready and just get stuff organized. So let's do that. Then a couple other reminders here. After spring break, um, the first day back from spring break is going to be a review session. We're going to rekindle our brains. I mean, I know that all of you are going to spend your spring breaks doing herpetological related things anyway, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, the first class back, back will be a review session. And then your exam is going to be that following Wednesday. I'll give you details about the structure and format and all of that coming soon, but we'll have a good review session. I've got one more thing for you to do today. It's going to take up the rest of the class time or as much as you want, and then you're done. Um, but I'm going to stop recording before I get to that and, and just turn the lights back on and stuff. Before we get to that, does anyone have any questions? Okay, the last bit here is I'm asking you to complete some information um, for Dr. Mason, he is really interested in, in teaching at an institution like this and, and really dedicated to kind of improving his teaching and just doing a great job. And his, your feedback on his work in the class would be greatly appreciated uh, by both him and I. He will really take it to heart. So please do take some time and answer those questions as best you can, uh, either now or, or later if you want to take it home, that's fine. I'm going to stop things here and just give you the rest of the time to do this. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions, just let me know. Otherwise, uh, have a great rest of your week, everybody.